Board of Engineers, and I've been a board member now, I think, for 54 years almost. So that's been quite a quite a run. Uh, let me introduce tonight's speaker, Colston Van Gundy, who goes by Cole, is Crowley's Vice President of Construction and Engineering and leads their vessel design and engineering construction management and project engineering teams. Cole has more than 15 years of experience in the field and has played a key role in advancing Crowley's engineering and design services in maritime and offshore wind services. He's been in both vessel and shore-based operational roles in engineering and led maritime development, construction and maintenance services, as well as served as a engineering leader for vessel operations. Most recently, Van Gundy has been instrumental in the design of the all-electric tugboat platform known as the E-Wolf, which is Crowley's zero emission ship assist and escort tug. Cole has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering with a U.S. Coast Guard license from the California Maritime Academy, where he also earned a master's degree in transportation and engineering management. Uh, ben Gundy holds a project management professional credential and maintains a U.S. Coast Guard engineering license. So with that, let's... Uh, Welcome Cole as our speaker tonight. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks for having me. And, and uh, yeah, as was said, if, if you have questions along the way, uh, please feel free to, to stop me and, and uh, we can have the, have the discussion. I don't have a, a ton of uh, slide content here, so, so welcome the engagement. All right, can you, uh, can you see that John? All right. So uh, a little bit, little bit about Crowley. So Crowley is a, uh, uh, a an older company, so older in the maritime uh, maritime industry. Uh, been around uh, about 160 years now. Uh, founded in 1892. Uh, headquartered in Jacksonville. Third generation owner now today. Um, about two and a half billion in, in annual revenue, um, and the largest Jones Act operator in the U.S. So what that means is uh, uh, all, 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 all trade going between two U.S. ports um, needs to be on a U.S. flagged vessel uh, manned by, uh, by U.S. crew. And Crowley is the largest carrier or the largest provider of that services uh, in, in here in the U.S. Outside the U.S., we also uh, operate primarily um, in the Central American Car Carib Caribbean, um, primarily with uh, oil transportation and container and logistic uh, support. So, uh, what, what's uh, what's Crowley about, and how does this uh, this e tug, this full electric tug, fit into uh, Crowley's uh, Crowley's value? So, what, what is uh, Crowley's purpose? Well, the purpose of Crowley is to enrich lives through innovation solutions done right, and and, and part of our values uh, are are with a, a safe, you know, high performing and integ and a high integrity team. Um, so the 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 e wolf or the fully electric truck fits perfectly in that in that goal, and throughout uh, the the next couple couple years here, Crowley's very interested in uh, reducing its carbon footprint. Um, so by 2025, Crowley will be the most sustainable and innovative merit uh, maritime and logistics solutions company in the Americas. So what does that mean? How are we going to do that? Um, well, we're, we're going to do that uh, not only through uh, reducing our carbon footprint, um, but also by by innovating and doing things differently and leading the market um, through uh, different things like carbon capture, uh, reducing uh, the carbon footprint for, from our tugs, like through an electric vessel, but also investing in the people um, that that can take us there. So. Part of uh, Parley's part of Crowley's uh, uh, goals to establish um, how, how we're going to reduce our emissions is to understand what type of emissions we're putting into uh, out into the the air today. So over the, over the past uh, uh, year, so 2020 is our baseline year. Um, we uh, basically analyzed our scope one and scope two um, and, and scope three, uh, but primarily scope one and two um, emissions. Understanding, uh, you know, what our what our company is producing, but also what uh, what feeds, uh, what's that supply chain, what what's the carbon footprint of that supply chain going in uh, into it, and um, right now um, our our focus is on scope one and two, 
And by 20, uh, uh, within the next couple of years here, we're really gonna try to reduce that by a significant percentage um, uh, in, in the 40% mark. So how does Crowley Engineering Services uh, fit within uh, the, the goals of, of, uh, of the sustain sustainability um, uh, goals of Crowley? So within Crowley, we have, a, have, a, have the shipping platform and the shipping platform is the, is the part of Crowley that, that owns and manages the vessels. But within that shipping platform, we have the engineering services team. So we, that, that's the team that I lead here today. And uh, we, we have the naval architects, we have the project engineers, and we have the construction managers. So what this means is we can, we can design, uh, design the vessels, um, and then we're gonna build the vessels as well and deliver them to the clients. So one of these first innovative pro projects that we're working on um, is the first fully electric um, tug here in the US. So what, is, what does that, uh, that tug look like? So th this is uh, just a short little video here. I'll pause it a couple times. Um, so it, it's, it's called the E-Wolf and it's, it's being built right now down in the Gulf of Mexico by master boat builders. Um, it's an azimuthing drive uh, uh, vessel producing 70 tons of bollard pole. It's got 70 tons of bollard pole and it's about 82 feet long. Um, now, now this design, uh, we, we focus on a couple things. Uh, because we, we have the unique, um, uh, the unique advantage of having operators uh, alongside the designers, we spent, we spent a year designing this vessel from the keel up. So in doing that, we, we integrated a, a self rescue zone um, it, to enable the, the crew to, to self-rescue in the event of a, of a man overboard. And why do we need that? Well, we need that because this vessel was designed uh, to be fully autonomous um, and to operate with a reduced crew. So if you have uh, limited crew members on board, one falls overboard, they need to be able to self-rescue while you still have the operator up, up in the pilot house. So we integrated this self-rescue zone uh, into the vessel design. All right, so what else, what else did we integrate into the design? Well, we, 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 we changed the way that the line is leading from the, from the winch uh, through the staple and into the ship. Uh, also, we, we've lowered the staples here to enable uh, the crew to safely uh, you know, uh, maneuver alongside the ship and not have the, have the, have the bits and the cleats uh, puncture ship, the ship while, while, they're, um, while they're working it. Another shot of the self rescue zone. And then, and then another thing from the, from the operator station, you can, you have 360 degree visibility. Um, and, and we have that because we have no stacks. There's no stacks because it's fully electric. So, so now probably what, what people are most interested in, what's down below, what's the basement, what, what's driving this thing. So, so here's where we have uh, over six megawatts of batteries up forward. These are lithium ion batteries. And then we have, uh, have the switchboard and then obviously the drives here behind it. Now the, uh, the battery room, uh, these are two rooms separated with an airlock. So we have, uh, have port and starboard and the, the, the port or the left side of the batteries uh, will feed the switchboard. And this switchboard uh, can, can drive either one of the drives or just one drive. So in the event that you did have a fire or casualty um, within, uh, within the battery room, um, you would, uh, you, you'd be able to isolate that battery room. Um, so how, how would the fires be suppressed? We have a, a high fog system within, uh, within the uh, E-tug e here. And that's a, a high pressure uh, water mist system.
All right, so, so what are the advantages of a fully electric tug here? So this was designed with the vessel operators has no exhaust stacks and 360 degrees of visibility uh, from the pilot's house uh, operator station. So why is that important? We need that we need to be able to, to see the contact points uh, at all times uh, during the ship assistant escort project. Uh, so what's a ship assistant escort project? Well, this is this is the um, you know this this is where the tugs are pushing in and out the vessels in and out of out of the uh, out of the harbors. Um, and now we have the, the ability and the advantage to push them in and out um, uh, with zero emissions. So the vessel does have uh, the ability uh, to, to, to transit long distances uh, when it doesn't have a battery, battery uh, capacity. It has two small generators um, on, on, on board, and these two small generators uh, enable the vessel to, to uh, operate at six knots, so at a reduced capacity, but not necessarily uh, to do ship assistant escort work. The, 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 main, um, the main reason that they're there is, to, uh, is really for redundancy based on uh, ABS and Coast Guard requirements, but, uh, but also uh, to enable it to transit, say, between San Diego and California, or uh, say, um, you know, the Gulf of Mexico over to the, to the, to the the west coast so as i said before the vessel is, is being constructed now uh, down at master boat builders down in bio battery uh, bio battery and um the the keel has just been laid so that that uh that vessel um should be delivered uh, uh in the gulf of mexico here in, in about 13 months from now and then to san diego harbor um, by about May of next uh, of next year. Um, as I was saying before, it's uh, capable of fully uh, operating fully autonomously, though that's not the intent of the operation. So uh, the the vessel, um, you know, can be operated via a joystick remotely, but uh, but right now that's not what we're going to do. So the vessel will be will be operated by the operators and this autonomous. Uh, these autonomous systems um, will, will increase the safety and efficiency of the operation by allowing the operators additional inputs, uh, visibility in, in fog conditions or lows of visibility environments, and then also, um, you know, uh, uh, avoidance, uh, collision avoidance systems uh, during during its uh, during its transit. And that system is being provided by ABB um, ABB today. So the battery system that's that is there, it's also it's a modular system. So the as the battery technology improves over the over the series of uh, of, of the following years, uh, we'll be able to pull pull a battery out, and and replace it. Or if one cell goes out, we'll be able to pull that out and and replace it, um, uh, over the life of the vessel. The the batteries themselves are designed to, um, uh, or I guess the the battery system was sized. For a ten-year life, so um, ba based on on the the load profile, uh, we calculate that we're going to need about six megawatts of battery at, at the end of the ten-year life. So that is the um, that is taking into account the the degradation of the batteries over over that lifetime. Um, it, it's designed to ABS class, um, which is a uh, um, a classification society. Uh, within the maritime sector, uh, happy to talk about that more. If you guys are interested, not not sure how how familiar you are with the, with ABS, but it is a classification society that that helps establish rules and guidelines um, to, to build to. Um, and then the Coast Guard is the governing body uh, out out on the water. So uh, you know where is it today? Like I said, so we're we're innovating, we're we're changing, we're we are the experts in the in, in the Jones Act market and the zero emission vessel design. This is the first uh, within the U.S. This is the uh, not the first to fully electric tug, but the first in the U.S. Um, and um, and and we're able to offer that turnkey solution. So this is is the is the first one for San Diego. There are a couple more under consideration now along the West Coast, and also supporting the offshore wind initiatives um uh, on the on the east coast now crowley is uh is one of the leading providers uh today in, in logistics uh um logistics support and um it has now just recently purchased a 
uh, a terminal in Salem, Massachusetts. And the, the E-Tug uh, would be a perfect, uh, a perfect addition to that, uh, to, that, to that fleet to support uh, renewable energy of, of offshore wind. So um, also a, a, as part of the offering, we're, we're gonna have the real-time visibility into the analytics and diagnostics of what, what the vessel's doing. So uh, we're, we're gonna be able to uh, advise the crew instead of uh, leaving uh, to go get this vessel or to meet this vessel out at port to, to follow it in uh, based on your knowledge and your guidance. Uh, we're we're going to be able to, to go out there and say, hey, you, you should leave, you know, five minutes earlier or 10 minutes later in order to optimize um, your, your transit out there uh, based on uh, wind, wave, and weather conditions, as well as uh, the most efficient, uh, efficient means of going out there, not to, to waste power away from the dock. And, and this will also allow us to, to see, um, you know, how, how pilots and how operators of, of these ships are using, are using the tugs. So the E-Tug will be able to uh, provide this real-time uh, analytics um, uh, dur during operation and also to plan. Um, and then, as I said, it's under construction. We have a handful of variants um, uh, that are, are going to be larger and, and, uh, and smaller um, depending on uh, the specific uh, need. And this is probably an okay time to maybe pause for a second. And uh, I think we had a couple questions pop up here. Let's see if I can figure out how to see them. Yeah, can you, can you see the chat? There's a question which just came in here, actually two questions. So I see it popping up here and up in the top, but I'm not. No, there oh, is on, the, there on the right button, there's the chat. If you click on it, you should see it. Yeah. Okay, a couple questions. Do you see this tugboat uh, in forestry applications with uh, towing or booming? Um, so uh, so this vessel uh, could uh, could tow, um, though it's likely not the most efficient use of, uh, of the vessel. Uh, the reason I say that is, is traditionally um, uh, long tows um, require a, uh, a longer need of battery and, um, and typically diesel or an alternative fuel such as methanol or LNG would be uh, a more efficient use of, of, uh, of, of the fuel source where batteries are, are best, um, best used for high loads and then periods of low loads. And then uh, what's the battery capacity uh, for, for that type of application? So uh, again, for, for longer, longer range, uh, longer pull requirements, um, we could definitely size the battery system for that. Um, but, but traditionally, those, uh, th those are smaller, smaller vessels that, that tow for longer periods of time, sometimes you know, two, three, four days. And, and to, to get that amount of battery in a small vessel would be, would be very difficult. And what do we expect the, the range uh, per charge to be? So the, the system, uh, the battery system was, was sized in order to uh, accommodate a, a one day's worth of work down in San Diego. So this was specifically sized for San Diego. Um, so, so that's 6.2 meg, you know, megawatts of battery. We expect that we'll need uh, three to four megawatts to complete, uh, to complete that work. Uh, and, th and then we'll have uh, additional charging uh, capacity on shore, which we'll talk about of how we can supplement that uh, with a DC to DC transfer. Um, is this something that stays in harbors and helps with docking and ship loading? Yes, so this, this stays within the harbor of San Diego. Um, it does not necessarily go out uh, for, uh, for a long tow. Uh, or, or a rescue. It does have the ability to go out for a rescue, but that's when we would need to use uh, these generators that you can see here on the picture, um, you know, to, to enable it to not uh, run out of battery capacity. So what, what that would be is, is consider it more of a range extending uh, type of design where the, you would start the generators when you left, uh, left the dock to go out to do a ship rescue to not, uh, to not use all of your your, your battery capacity uh, during that transit out. Um, and yes, and, and same thing. 
So that's what that those generators on, on board are, are able to propel the vessel without an electric charge uh, up to about six knots. I'm going to get to the last question here um, on the next couple of slides talking about charging. Does anybody else have any other questions as we're kind of paused here? No? Okay. So, so just just kind of an overview, an overview of, of the design. Um, so again, 82 foot length, and um, that that's from uh, the, the molded length. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit uh, longer than that, about 85 feet from from the tip of the of the fender to to the other tip of the fender. Um, it has a, has a draft um, of about 16 feet. So that's about from these marks down to the bottom of the of the drives is about 16 feet and 40 foot across. So what do the accommodations look like? Well, the accommodations are sized really for day boat operations. So the, these people are, are not going to be um, uh, living on this vessel full time. Um, the, the vessel was sized, the specific vessel was sized uh, for them to be living, living on shore. Though uh, for long, long transits, um, there is four bunks um, and, and a small galley or a small kitchen um, and a small head or a small bathroom there on board to accommodate them. Uh, one of the advantages of this design um, is the the engines are actually located on the main deck. So traditionally, um, the the engines are going to be located down down below, um, and and this is actually a fully conditioned space. So both the the battery room, as well as the uh, as a switchboard room, are air conditioned. Uh, obviously, that that requires energy that needs to come from the battery system, um, but it's a completely clean environment. So traditionally, you're going to have uh, dirty engines and dirty bilges down below. Um, that Nothing like that down here. This is a conditioned like you're, you're walking into a controlled environment where now we have uh, have the engines that will, will only be run for long-term transit and not be uh, not running um, um, you know, uh, while, while underway under normal operations unless it's some emergency. Um, that they'll be up on the main deck and isolated. So the, the quote, dirty space is, is very small in comparison to a traditional design. Um, the, the, the other advantage of having um, these generators up on the main deck is that should you ever need to exchange them, which, which uh, traditionally happens uh, with these small marine engines, is you can cut a hole in the back of the vessel, that should be a patch, to slide the slide these engines uh, slide these engines right out, and you can see this little this little hole here. That's actually the exhaust uh, for these small generators. Um, so what's unique about the about the winches? So these are just uh, render recovering winches. So these are very traditional in the workboat space, and they'll be uh, you know the, the the bow and the stern will will be identical um, with with, uh, with the ability to. Um, you know, tow tow a vessel or or to put a line up to uh, to a, a car carrier, or an oil tanker, or or container vessel um, down down in the port of uh, port of San Diego. Um, okay, so ne next question I had: What's the difference in operators' controls for electric versus a standard tug? So the operation of the vessel is very is very. Um, very similar, so th there's not a whole lot of difference in, in the operations of the controls up above. The, the difference is, is going to be the noise and the sound, just like driving an electric car. Um, this is uh, this is going to be a near silent operation. Um, so um, the, the controls, you know, um, are are identical for a diesel versus a uh, versus an electric tug. Um, but there will be additional training uh, that's being provided by by ABB, which is the, the integrator of the whole electric system. So they're providing the batteries, the switchboard, uh, the drives, as well as the, uh, the autonomous operation. So additional training will be required for them to become familiar with the maintenance and care of, uh, of the electric systems, as well as the, uh, um, the autonomous operations up in the wheelhouse or the, you know, the collision avoidance systems up in the wheelhouse. Um, yes, and what are the green items on the cutaway? Those are those are the generators that uh, that I was just here talking about. All right, so uh, lots of questions on the on the charging. So let's let's get to that. Um, 
I, I kind of highlighted that one. Um, so, so how's it charged? So uh, today uh, we are we are providing the charging infrastructure. So uh, th this is two 40 foot containers on the dock uh, that have three megawatts of battery in them, um, and it can charge at uh, at a rate of one megawatt per hour. Though the infrastructure is able to, uh, so I guess the bottleneck for for that charging um, is is going to be the cables. So on on the on the vessel side, we can charge uh, at uh, at a higher rate as well as the discharge rate uh, from the from the the containers on dock is also able to accommodate a larger charging or discharge. Um, but we're sizing the cables to allow uh, one one uh one crew member to, to plug the vessel in um so what what are maybe some of the uh some of the advantages of this well we're we're able to to draw power from the grid at a reduced rate and store it store it on uh on the on the dock using utilizing these batteries now we can uh we can charge at a more rapid rate uh if desired but we don't want to um we don't want to put uh, put a spike onto the grid and we also don't want to uh, penalize our um, our, uh, our our rate of electricity. Um, so so the more we pull, um, obviously the higher the rate rate's going to be. Um, we also will we'll be able to do a DC to DC transfer. So um, that'll be a more efficient method of, of charging charging the vessel um, instead of going from from AC uh, to DC and, and having that converter on the on the vessel. That'll be done here uh, up here side. There's solar panels provided on top uh, to do a, to do a triple charge, um, but but the primary means of charging that battery is going to be from the grid. Some of the the unique um, advantages of this type of design um, is, is it doesn't really, the, the tug doesn't care where the power comes from. Um, so so some of the other concepts out uh, out on the market are uh, charging this via you know a renewable uh, renewable source of electricity um, such as uh, offshore wind. Um, a, a methanol reformer, you know, a hydrogen, uh, hydrogen um, a fuel cell, um, or, or or any any kind of combination uh, of of a of a green source of fuel. So, one of the uh, one of the ideas that that uh, that's being kicked around um, is is down in San San Diego having a a, a charging buoy um, that uh, can can come. Come alongside out out in the middle of the harbor. Now this is just pure concept. Um, we can uh, we can poke a lot of holes in the in the idea, but the purpose of this rendering here is to spark some conversations about you know what's possible, what's not possible um, in in pulling power off of a buoy um, to char to charge the tug. Um, What's a what? Uh, here's some other questions. What is the battery recharge time? So I think I addressed that. So one megawatt, uh, one megawatt of charging per hour. We expect to use about four, um, four megawatts of uh, uh, of power over a given day. So that would be about a four hour charge. Um, now, what what are the plans and timelines to move uh, from crude to remote and then fully autonomous? So right now, uh, though we're technically capable of of operating fully uh, fully autonomously, um, the the regulations are not there. So this this vessel is is here um, to help establish what those regulations are going to be, and, and and help understand where the uh, where the potential pitfalls and and risk could be to the operation. Um, so I suspect that a fully autonomous um, uh, tug is probably five to ten years. Away, based on you know, uh, you know, uh, on regulations, and then all, also crew input. Um, but but the vessel is capable and will be capable of doing that. And then as a follow-up, what additional technology will be required to achieve this? There will well, as of now, we don't believe any additional uh, technology will be uh, will be required to achieve um, to achieve uh, autonomous operation. Um, there are vessels operating over in Europe uh, fully autonomously. As well as here in the U.S., um, the difference is uh, those vessels go from a uh, one point to another um, and don't necessarily have to interact with uh, with uh, with bumping ships in and out of, uh, of harbors. 
Um, I think that that operation will be very difficult to, to replicate um, in an autonomous environment. But one one part of uh, one part of the, the the tugs journey that might be more more easily easily um, autonomous is is transiting between two ports. So take the, the Seattle Harbor as an example. We have tugs say down in Tacoma, and then we get a call that you need to come go up to Anacortes to move a ship in. So the vessel or or the tug, you know, has a has an eight hour transit uh, from Tacoma up to uh, up to Anacortes, and um, that's a pretty boring transit for, for a lot of the operators. So why not use uh, some autonomous features uh, to allow that tug to, to transit, you know, more safely and, uh, uh, you know, in the future, uh, you know, possibly by itself, but coming away from the dock um, and, um, you know, moving ships in and out um, might be done remotely, uh, but, but will not be done uh, in the near term uh, autonomously. How many, how many crew are anticipated for normal operation? So uh, the, the crew um, right now, uh, the, the size of this vessel, let me go back to uh, this picture here. Um, the, the crew um, is, is done by, it was four people. Um, that is a typical harbor, harbor tug crew. Um, so, but only two people are up at any given time. So you have one operator and one deckhand. So again, this one was designed to be um, uh, a day boat. Um, so right now it will be two people um, operating the vessel just during the day. I have another design um, that it, that's uh, under development right now, should start construction uh, uh, this year, um, which is, a, is basically a, a larger version of this um, that has additional crew accommodations for a, a, a routine four four-man crew. We also have a, an even larger uh, variant of this that can produce 100 metric tons um, that, that has more accommodations. But typically, a four-person crew is what, what's used uh, for, for harbor, harbor work here in Puget Sound uh, specifically. Um, what, what is unique about San Diego operation for this first application? San Diego is, is, a, is a, a very protected, uh, protected environment. And it has a has a very set schedule, so because of that, um, the we were able to um, I guess analyze the data to to per, to to project out the the amount of power that we're going to need. Um, also, it you don't get a lot of changes in that ship schedule. So um, unlike LA Long Beach, where where you're you're trading a lot of jobs at a higher higher volume, or or in in Seattle. Um, where it has a has a larger volume of, uh, of vessels coming in and out, um, San Diego uh, was a perfect environment because it's a set schedule. You know when ships are coming in and out. You have time to charge um, throughout the day if needed, um, but but also if you uh, if you are going to be working a full day, you have the ability to um, you know uh, to do that with the with the six megawatt uh, battery system. So you know why 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 were we kind of limited? Well, the uh, 79 foot waterline mark is a um, is is a regulator uh, limit. So uh, above that requires additional regulations. Below that, um, th there are less regulations. Now Crowley has has elected to follow um, many of the requirements um, for for uh, vessels over that regulation. But um, but but we are still below that. Should um, you know, should should something come up? Um, but but we uh, but but that is kind of the limiting factor. Trying to stay under 79 foot, and, and you have uh, proportional uh, requirements. So the proportional requirements, um, you, you can't necessarily go too much wider because then you come uh, become more of a barge and not not necessarily a vessel. Um, so this is about as much battery system as you can fit. In a in a under 79 foot uh, uh, tug, so much much larger beyond this, you have uh, economic impacts from the battery system, um, and then uh, you also have um, uh, you have to you have to go to a larger platform. Uh, next question: Does does the tug have any firefighting uh, systems? 
So this is not a uh, Fifi uh, rated tug or uh, firefighting uh, rated tug. It does have uh, firefighting systems for onboard uh, fire applications, but it does not have uh, external fire monitors to fight fires uh, uh, on board, you know, say, say a, a, a an oil carrier. Um, it could, um, but again, we're, we're, we're limited uh, by the length uh, based on kind of an operations requirement and, uh, and, and fitting additional fire pumps down into the, uh, into the, into the vessel systems uh, would, be, would be a challenge. Um, this is a pretty, uh, pretty tight system. Probably not for, uh, I think, one of you, you, you uh, submariners there. This is probably wide open, but for, for the commercial world, this is, this is pretty tight. Um, and I think that was uh, the last slide I had in my presentation. So, so John, I, I, I've been trying to answer the questions as we've been going along here. Um, but if, uh, if we have additional questions, I'd be happy to, to, to take those. And you, I see you talking, but I can't hear you. Uh, anyway, thanks, Cole. It was a uh, very interesting. Uh, so I, I think uh, the group is not too large. So uh, I think for discussion now, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask the question directly. And uh, uh, whilst I'm talking, I have a, a question. Uh, obviously, the maritime conditions, you have tidal currents, you have winds, uh, undercurrents, and, and that kind of stuff. So I'm, just assuming that the, the specification when you're saying it uh, it has been laid out for a day's worth of work that that's probably including some kind of uh, worst case condition so what we did is we took a a vessel that's operating down in san diego right now we analyzed the consumption of that vessel over a, a period a number of years and then sized the battery system to accommodate uh the the extremes uh, of that of that vessel's operation, so so the the batteries you know were sized um, you know for for the worst case scenario, and then we have the generators there. Should you know some you know something happen, we we have the ability to get home. Thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. I see I see the question here. Any plans for uh, an electric shock in Puget Sound? Uh, yes, I would love it. Um, we, we have a, a couple uh, on the uh, uh, under development right now. And like I said, uh, hopefully uh, by the end of the year, we can start construction on those. Those are going to be a different variant, though. Those are likely to be a more hybrid uh, hybrid variant and not necessarily fully electric. So uh, because you, what are the reasons? Well, because tugs don't just work in, say, Seattle. Um, you're going to need to run up to Anacortes. You're going to need to run up to uh, to Everett uh, or, or or down to Tacoma. So to to have an electric vessel uh, to be able to perform that, um, you'd need charging time in, in between the two uh, in order to to be able to push those vessels in and out. Now, if uh, if things are planned out perfectly, then yeah, then we can accommodate that. You know, we can transit uh, you know at, at a slower a slower rate, slower environment. Uh, or yet at a slower rate to, to, to save power, right? It, it's, it's an electric vessel, so um, uh, operating um, at, at uh, you know, at 10, 10 plus knots um, is, is not as efficient. Um, but, but we would have the ability, say, to, um, you know, push the vessels or the ships in and out in a fully electric way. Uh, so would the tugs be built locally? So, uh, at, at, here at Crowley, uh, we have an open competitive bid uh, uh, bid solicitation. Um, we would love for tugs to be built here uh, in Puget Sound. In fact, um, one of the one of the shipyards here in Puget Sound was uh, one of the finalists uh, for the for the E Wolf. Um, that that was Nichols Brothers Boat Builders. Um, they they, uh, 
they they unfortunately didn't didn't win the the E Wolf, um, but uh, but there are uh, very capable uh, shipbuilders uh, and shipyards here within uh, Puget Sound that uh, that would that would likely uh, be a good good candidate um, for, for the next vessels. Uh, what drives the decision between propeller designs uh, versus cyclorials? So um, it, it really has to do with the efficiencies and the preferences of the operators. So uh, Crowley today uh, operates uh, cyclorial drives, which, which look like egg beaters. Um, so those are voice Schneider propellers. And, and um, th those are considered quote, true tractors by, by some of the Europeans. Um, the, uh, the design of those has not really changed in, in like 100 years. Um, but, uh, but, but they're, they're, they're still very expensive. They're expensive to maintain, they're inspected, inspected or expensive to install. Um, but they're very, they're very maneuverable. Um, where, where these, uh, the Z drives were in this case, it's actually an L drive. So the electric motor is on top with an L coming down, uh, for the, for, for the propeller. Um, that is a pretty efficient, uh, means of, of, uh, of, of transmitting, uh, electric, uh, a current directly to the water. Um, Voice Schneider did come out with a um, with an electric version of their Voice Schneider propeller, which we are looking at. In, in fact, they were considered uh, for 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 the E Wolf, but ultimately um, an L drive was chosen. If if you haven't uh, if you haven't Googled Voice Schneider propellers before uh, go on YouTube. They're, they're pretty cool. There's, they even have an app where you can try to drive a tugboat with a voice Schneider. It's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> any, any other, uh, any other questions? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. This is John Hutchins. Um, I understand that uh, one charge uh, is equivalent to about 6,000 Teslas. Is that uh, about right? That's right, yeah. Uh, so is it 6,000 or 600? Uh, so, uh, um, so it's That's a six megawatt. Um, yeah. What's a Tesla? Is that uh, that that's like a a point point one, right? A thousand kilowatts. Yeah. 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 And uh, um, uh, my source at Crowley, I think that was uh, what uh, what they told me. Um, yeah, Tucker. You might know okay. him. Yeah, Tucker yeah. Joe. Yeah. I, it, it's, yeah, it's either 600 or 6,000. Uh, we've got a whole team of engineers here. Okay. I'm sure we could convert, yeah, megawatts to kilowatts here pretty easily, but yeah. <laughs> At any rate, it's a lot. It, it's a lot. That's right. It's it's a big number. <laughs> yeah. We can use that professional engineering term. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, are are I didn't hear, but are are you uh, located here in Seattle? I am located in Seattle. Yep, this is okay. my, my, and have my, you my home home base. Okay, have you moved from Pier Seventeen, or are you still, or are you in your new off new facilities? No, so we're still in Pier Seventeen, um, though uh, that ends here in one month. So I think uh, March sixth or seventh or so. We're moving out of Pier 17, okay. and we're moving to the new office uh, there in Seattle, near, uh, near the right. stadiums. Is that down in the Pioneer Square area somewhere? Yeah, if you know where the Sound Transit building is, it's uh, it's right yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right next to the Wajimaya in the International District there. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so I, I do have a comparison here. I don't know about the Tesla, but um, I, I just got the 
the latest brochure of the Nissan Leaf, and uh, that one uh, has a 62 kilowatt hours battery. Uh, now, when you're talking six megawatt, is that six megawatt hours or just? 6.3 megawatt or 6.2 megawatt hours. Yeah, so that's actually really, yeah, it's, it's a, that is a factor thousand. Well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty big. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's big. That That's will be a lot of batteries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I guess one so question I see, will you see be, here. Will you be outfitting um, your birthing area here in the Puget Sound pretty soon, or would that? That'll come as the vessels come online. Um, yes. Yeah, so as the vessels, you know, as we replace vessels in Puget Sound, um, we'll, we'll have different designs and different different vessel uh, characteristics to meet the meet the the specific port and the operator's needs. Um, so okay. we'll have additional berths, additional uh, capacity, additional uh, you know pushing or towing capacity. Um, as well as uh, maybe more battery capacity or or in one of the designs, depending on which one the operators decide it has less battery capacity. But the, the purpose of that is to try to drive down some of the capital costs associated with the uh, with the tug. All right, so you're dispatching pretty much out of Seattle for Puget Sound is, uh, you know, out of uh, Pier 17, but that will change. Is that correct? And then uh, you would have uh, charging stations, maybe in Anacortes or Everett or Tacoma or that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, so so we're we're going to continue to dispatch out of Seattle. They'll move from Pier 17 with us to the new building. You know, uh, we, okay. we've learned that um, you can dispatch remotely. You don't necessarily need to do it from from the office. You know, uh, over COVID, we we, we proved that. Though we've kept one dispatcher in the office at all times down there, um, but yes, we will have a charging station set up. We're working with um, uh, the, the Port of Seattle and Tacoma actually right now, talking about um, as they're building out their infrastructure. Um, you know, what does that infrastructure look like in planning, port planning? You know, to provide charging capacity, say for ships, but also for for tugs uh, like like us. So building out that that network of charging is needed. Another another method of charging is, is a is a charging barge. So you can have this barge positioned in various locations, you know, in inside the harbor, outside the harbor, um, you know, that you can tow around and kind of exchange and have tugs or ships, you know, tie up next to it. it sounds like a maritime concept of aerial refueling. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, one of the questions here is the tug designed to operate in Alaska. Um, so, uh, as with electric vessels or electric or electric vehicles, electric vessels do have a more difficult time operating in cold environments. This vessel was not um, uh, not sized with with the heater capacity in order to operate in the Alaskan waters. It's not to say that the technology isn't there. It just requires additional power power consumption. Uh, to accommodate the colder environments to keep the batteries, uh, keep the batteries warm. So, uh, when will this uh, vessel um, uh, go into operation? Uh, this tug uh, in San Diego. Yeah, about about uh, about thirteen to to fourteen months from now. Okay. All right. Possibly twenty twenty four. Oh no, we, we, there's never delays in in, in prototypes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this is a whole new era, and that's that's great. I mean, um, life goes on. We got to keep up with it. Yeah, no, th th this is uh, 
this is kind of the, the new uh, sustainable environment that we're we're all working towards right now. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited to be part of it. Um, you know, we're we're excited to help uh, help identify where those challenge areas are so that we can provide some solutions and get more of these these built. Um, if not, you know, this exact design, you know, a variant of the of it. Are there other companies, and the other company, I guess, is FOSS, uh, are they looking into uh, a, autonomous vehicles or autonomous vessels? Um, they are looking into it, you know, uh, under different avenues. You know, um, uh -huh. we, we, we've been in discussion with them, though they're our competitor. Um, yes. You know, we we work together a lot with Foss, um, so so really um, um, the the whole industry is excited for the for the new opportunities here, um, and and how okay. autonomous operation might supplement uh, supplement our work. You, you could have a common uh, train station, uh, and and then the could be a fee for, for charging or that sort of things, all, all business elements that would have to be worked out. But I see yeah, that's, it. That's the objective is to try to commercialize this, right? So um, incentivize, um, you know, customers to, to want clean, you know, uh, clean energy or, or a clean assist in and out of the dock. Okay, now look, we, could, uh, we could go to the conversation that uh, uh, passenger ferries, and they'd be small, uh, you know, for moving from uh, moving personnel from Bremerton to Seattle or from one of the islands or, or wherever uh, into downtown Seattle. And so that would that be on the horizon as far as charging stations go? Yeah, there there is a design on the drawing board that um, uh, for the Washington State ferries, um, right? You know, to electrify. Um, I, I can't remember the class of vessel, but to electrify uh, one of those uh, one of those sets of vessels that are being built at Vigor right now. Um, so okay. that, that is using uh, similar technologies here. So one of those proposed integrators was ABB. It's the same integrator that uh, that we're using here on the on the EWOL. All right, and the uh, the method of charging would be with a conductor uh, from the the charging station, whether it's a floating one or a fixed one at the pier. Um, I have seen other uh, other. Uh, electrification systems where there was a large contact, uh, I'll call it a contact board, but it's um, where uh, there was an interface between the vessel and, and shore. And I think that may be used in Alabama or uh, someplace down south. There's, is that something that you can comment on, or is that something that's? I mean, the ferries were looking at that because they would take it. It will take quite a you know quite a bit of power uh, for only a few minutes. Uh, while the vessel, while a ferry would be uh, in the slip loading, uh, back loading and discharging vehicles. Um, so maybe yes. they maybe the charging system would be large enough so that they could operate for 16 hours, and then uh, the other hours would be at 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 the charging station. Is are those possibilities or likelihoods? Yeah, so that, that's all that's all possible. The technology is there. Um, last we looked into it. Um, those induction type of charging systems couldn't uh, couldn't produce the power um, near as as quickly as a you know a, a hard cable because you can you can get power right. uh, 
more 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 quickly. Um, but that that technology is always advancing. There's also um, some some ferry uh, charging system designs that that don't uh, don't require human interface. So um, you can have that conductor uh, plug directly in without without the need of a person sitting there handling the cable. And those are are right. primed for for a ferry coming in and out of the dock at the same uh, same spot. Right. Right. Well, okay. And of course, you have to work with tides. <laughs> right. But they've got that figured out with their ramps now. So, I mean, th that's not terribly complex to, to get the 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 conductor, um, you know, tied with the ramps. Yeah. Well, that's that's a lot of power to pass through one conductor. Huh? Yeah, again, it's it's multiple conductors um, to, to, yeah. to pass this type of power. Well, nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of beep beep, so it seems like. Uh, People think uh, they uh, got all the information they need and uh, dropping off. Um, so um, you know, let me um, just uh, thank you again for giving that presentation and uh, answering those questions. So we'll, uh, uh, I, I will uh, send you a link to the uh, uh, present to the presentation and the, and the video where it is uh, once I once I get it established and. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's it on on behalf of the Northwest section. Uh, thank you again, and um, wish everybody a nice evening. Thank you for attending. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Cole. All right, bye. Thank you.